All right guys, Murph's here. And today I wanna to talk about the effectiveness of handguns and long range type engagements. Now something that you'll frequently see on YouTube or sometimes espoused by different people is the ability to use your handgun in a long range type environment because that might be all that you have. And while that could be true, there's a lot of other things that impact that overall decision beyond you see opponent and then you engage them with the handgun. There's, there's a lot of stuff, especially if we're primarily discussing this in a self-defense type measure, not necessarily professional. We'll talk about handguns both professionally and for your average concealed carry license holder, but and it'll, it'll kind of bounce back and forth. But overall, we need to discuss a lot of different aspects of choosing to utilize your handgun in a long range engagement and the things that you need to weigh in your mind before you do so. It's not that unusual to see, especially on different YouTube channels, guys shooting handguns to long distances and making hits. And it might make it seem like a very easy and reasonable thing to do. But there's a lot more context that's required in this overall conversation. Now, a couple things that I want to go ahead and highlight right off the bat for this discussion. Handguns are terrible fight stoppers. That is what lots of FBI data has shown us. Handguns are great because they are portable. They're the weapon that we are more likely to have when the fight actually shows up, especially in a concealed carry sense, because carrying a rifle or a shotgun all day is not necessarily practical. But rifles or shotguns are far better fight stoppers. And if you know you're going into a fight, you need to be reaching to reaching for a rifle or a shotgun as opposed to a handgun. Obviously, situationally independent, comfort level, all those types of things. Now, some cartridges perform in niche type categories in which they're actually better able to be able to perform at maybe a little bit greater distances or even well in close range distances. But there's a lot of things that impact that overall. A lot of those cartridges are high impulse cartridges. They have heavy recoil. They maybe don't carry as many rounds and they might have larger frames that don't fit into the average person's hand. So if you're advocating for that and not even just a concealed carry sense in this case, because a lot of these guns will be quite big and not necessarily the most adept at being concealed. And I know I'm kind of rabbit holing a little bit here, but you put a larger cartridge into a smaller handgun trying to get that greater power, it becomes even more difficult to control. Even professional sense or concealed carry sense, it's not just the ability to be able to conceal, but also the ability for the stature of that person to be brought into account so that somebody with small fingers can still carry a handgun for defense, be it female police officers or military, whatever it is that it may be. There are personnel of all of a wide variety of body shapes and sizes that need to be able to work around these handguns. So that's why nine millimeters so popular because you can find a ton of different handguns in a frame that everyone can carry. All right, so handguns, not great fight stoppers. And that's going to be an idea that we keep a hold of all throughout this because already we've established the idea that even at normal ranges, handguns are not good at stopping fights. And we're going to discuss trying to stop fights at longer distances with the same suboptimal cartridge and how much, we're, how much time we're spending planning or shoehorning ourselves into the possibility of having to use a suboptimal system in order to win a fight. All right. Now, next thing we need to talk about what is long range in handguns? Because it's very different than what long range is in rifles. Now, commonly, if you look at a lot of police and self-defense data that's out there on the market, uh, put, or out there in the wild, put together by the FBI, the average engagement distance is considered to be three to seven yards. That's pretty close. So that's definitely not constituting long range in this case. This is the norm. This is what we expect to have happen. Now, you go to a lot of courses and they might have you shoot 10 to 15 yards for different drills and all that kind of stuff. You'll still do close-up stuff as well, but they might have you step back and, and work through uh, really nailing down those fundamentals by shooting at a little bit greater distance than you probably normally would. Well, that's not really long range either, if you think about it. That's still fairly close. That's definitely close enough to still have to get in the fisticuffs with somebody if you didn't draw your gun fast enough. Okay. All right, well, there are 25-yard bullseye competitions, and quite frequently, 25 yards will also be used in courses in order to be able to help people identify where their fundamentals are falling apart for them. So is, is 25 yards considered long range? Well, not particularly. I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, there might be some things you have to take into account for that engagement distance, but I wouldn't consider it long range by any means. If you look at military doctrine, at times 50 yards has been identified as the 
max distance to engage with a pistol. Well, that's that's kind of getting out there. That's that's kind of far. I don't know if I'd still call it long range at this point. Then you have 100 yards. Now, in my opinion, 100 yards becomes kind of difficult for a handgun. It's not impossible. It might be a little bit easier to engage still with a pistol cartridge with some type of pistol caliber carbine or perhaps a three point of contact rifle or three points of contact pistol, I guess I should say. Rifles, of course, have three points of contact, but three points of contact pistol or what you might better know as a braced pistol would probably be a little bit better for reaching out to that distance, but you're still fighting with a pistol cartridge. We'll get into that here in a moment. And then, of course, you have tons of people on YouTube who've shown themselves shooting out of like 400 with handguns, which we have solidly moved into the ra into the realm of exhibition style shooting. Like, look at this cool thing that I can do, but doesn't necessarily translate to being practical in the fight. So the question is, where does that line reside at? Where do we cross over into exhibition shooting and away from actual practical fighting type shooting? Because all of this kind of gets painted in the same idea that there's shooting for sport or doing drills and stuff like that. And then there's fighting, which is a much more complex process. There's a lot more things that you have to think through and consider and plan for and all those types of stuff. Fighting is not just based around shooting. Shooting is an aspect of fighting, but there's a lot more that goes into actual fighting and then pulling a trigger. All right, so let's go ahead and kind of talk about a data-driven portion of this. If you look at a lot of different data out there for handgun cartridges, you will find that there's a lot of research published on the efficacy of handgun cartridges. And of course, most of it is actually relatively bleak. If you look at 9mm, 40, and 45, and you take into account their velocities and grainage and do the math in order to be able to project their energy, you'll find that they're all fairly similar in actual energy output. Now, of course, bullet design does play a part into this in how it is that it interacts with tissue and all that kind of stuff. And I think we can all pretty much agree that hollow points are the answer to effective self-defense type rounds. Now, the FBI has established a lot of data on this and, and has a comprehensive testing process that they put potential service cartridges through and other other resources have copied the same testing criteria and applied it to a wide variety of cartridges. I like to use Lucky Gunner because there's a lot of data that is represented there as long as multiple shot strings instead of just a single. They've been spending a lot of time working on that. And if you look at that, you look at FBI data, it's supposed to be 18 inches of penetration in calibrated ballistic gel and one and a half times expansion on a hollow point projectile. That's supposed to give you, well, between 12 and 18 inches. That's what it's supposed to give you an ideal fight stopping dynamic with your pistol cartridge. Doesn't matter what caliber it is. That's the data that they pulled through. What you gotta keep in mind whenever we're talking about pistol ballistics and how it performs in the body, you don't have a lot of secondary wound channel. You don't have a lot of that hydraulic type action that occurs in fluid and air filled cavities of the body as the bullet passes through. You've got that expansion and you've got penetration and hoping that you hit a switch or a timer or whatever it is that's gonna deactivate this fight. That's, that is the, the kind of data-driven portion here. And if you look at a lot of lists out there, there are some cartridges that are not achieving FBI minimums. It happens, it's a reality. Keep in mind that they're not achieving FBI minimums at short distances. If you increase that distance out 50, 100 yards, you're not getting a better result with that. In fact, you're probably more likely gonna have less expansion, less penetration. Now, keep in mind on the, uh, the 12 to 18 inches of penetration thing, that's calibrated ballistic shell. And that is supposed to take into account fat, uh, muscle, flesh, bones, air-filled cavities, fluid-filled cavities, all those different types of things that you're gonna interact with in the body. It's not a, a apples to apples, 18 inch, penetration comparison. It's going to be very different than the human body. It's going to get more different the greater distance you put out there as that velocity starts to peter out, especially since for the most part, pistol bullets are not terribly aerodynamic. There's some, the 5.7 millimeter cartridge is very aerodynamic and has a great flat, flat shooting trajectory. Maybe not the best energy delivery, but it's fast. But that velocity is still going to uh, bleed off rather rapidly because that is a very lightweight projectile as well. All right, so we kind of talked about the data-driven portion. Let's put a lot more of that data into context. Now, we already know that we, we can already extrapolate that we're not necessarily gonna get the same performance out of our cartridges, but at the very least, we're still putting hits on the target, right? 
So, you know, if I suddenly get new holes in my body when I'm trying to perform some type of action, that's gonna really diminish my ability or interest in doing that particular action. Really, even bullets ricocheting around me might change my overall dynamic there. We're gonna talk about that more here in a second. But, yes, hits are what are gonna count. No matter what the distance is, as long as you're hitting somebody, you're putting the fight into your benefits. You start giving them something else to think about, you start making it to where their body's not working the way it's supposed to, you have a better opportunity to win. However, that does not mean that placing those hits is going to be as easy. There's a lot of things you have to take into account. First off, your fundamentals have to be switched on. And not only do your fundamentals have to be switched on, but they have to be switched on when your adrenaline's pumping, when you're in fear for your life, or at least you should be in fear for your life in this case because you're pulling your gun. All those types of things. You've got a lot that's riding on you being calm, easy, and collected, and you're not necessarily going to be there in those situations. People spend years going through stress inoculation type training and still have it fall apart on game day because it's just, it's, fights are funny that way. Every fight is a little bit different. Every, every dynamic in the fight is always going to be a little bit different. It might change how it is that you perceive what it is, what it is that's going on. I actually, I helped instruct a course this weekend, uh, which was entirely based around uh, high stress type situations, lots of running, lots of carrying weights and, and solving different you know, cognitive type problems and all that kind of stuff. And I watched experienced shooters completely dump what it was that they were doing and drain, drain away all of their fundamentals on short range targets under 15 yards. And they were having trouble getting everything to connect once that exhaustion kicked in once that heartbeat was up and their blood was pounding in their ears. So it's not that, that's one very individual but very significant portion of the long range engagement with handguns, but also actually being able to connect those sights with that target. If you're shooting iron sights, that's gonna, that's gonna really change how much of the target that you're able to actually view as you engage it, which is going to make making corrections very difficult. Now, keep in mind with that, at close range, let's say you're half an inch off of your intended target, but you're still in, you know, whatever thoracic area that you need it to be. That's fine. Everything's great. Up at seven yards, it's not a big deal. Let's call it five yards. But if you increase that distance out to 100, that, that disparity increases exponentially. And that's going to be a problem. That is potentially missing your target cleanly, and now where did that bullet go? Because at the end of the day, you're still accountable for that bullet. And you can very quickly turn this from a justified shoot into a homicide investigation, and all of a sudden, you're in trouble. You became a part of the problem, not the solution. Now, DOT assist, uh, assisted pistols, guns with RMRs or any other type of optic, they help with this. They open up a window so that you can actually be able to potentially view your engagement with that target, but you still have to be on. And it's great that now you've got an entire man-sized target to be able to engage, hopefully. That's what you're engaging at 50 or 100 yards, but the the pressure's on. And cartridges like 357 SIG, uh, 10 millimeter, or 5.7, are rather flat shooting and that will at least help out but you're still losing the observation capability especially if you're working with iron sights that's a potential problem and trying to decide whether or not you're actually doing what it is that you need to do now one of the most significant portions of this is how do you justify in a self-defense type situation that you needed to take a long-range shot with a handgun now this is something that is going to be very individual to the state and locality and counties and all those types of things. You have to know your local laws. But if you're in a state with a duty to retreat, you definitely are probably going to have some difficulty convincing a jury of your peers that a 100-yard shot had to be taken in order to stay alive. You know? Uh, someone at seven yards away with a baseball bat is far more of a threat to you than someone 100 yards away with a baseball bat, even if they're screaming obscenities and telling you how they're going to kill you. It doesn't matter. They're that far away. You have the ability to be able to leave, to avoid the problem, to de-escalate the situation as best you can. And really, in general, that's your duty as a concealed carry license holder to begin with. You don't want to have to use your gun. You have the gun present in case all other opportunities have been exhausted. 
you need to try to extricate yourself from that situation because just because you're the guy, just because in your head you're the hero, that doesn't mean you're the hero in everyone else's head. You're gonna have to convince everybody that you are the hero that you portray yourself to be. And that might be difficult, especially if you're taking 100 yard shots. At the end of the day, if you don't have to shoot your gun and you get out of the situation and nobody gets hurt, that's a win. Give a description of the person in the police, they can track him down, they can start doing their job. It is not your job to be judge, jury, and executioner. In this case, you're not a cop, unless you're a cop, but that's a whole different thing. So, you still have to keep in mind that if you get into a shootout with somebody, not only do you have to convince a jury, and let's say you win the criminal matter, that doesn't mean that you're not exposed to potential civil liability as well. Be it the family sues you or there's some damage to property that someone wants to come after you over, let alone if you shoot somebody else, which is definitely going to complicate the overall criminal matter. So we're talking about a very slim number of circumstances where somebody is going to be armed well enough to engage you at 100 yards and it be a viable reason for you to shoot back. So this is a very slim number of circumstances, unless you're military or law enforcement. So law enforcement primarily move about with their handguns. So handguns are what they're most likely going to have available to them when they have to get into or when they get into a shootout. And if they're dealing with a an active shooter or something along those lines, they might have to take the low probability long range shot. However, they still have to consider all the factors that are involved with that. And it might be better for them to maneuver closer utilizing cover. They, they, they still have the possibility of, of shooting someone they did not intend to. In fact, I remember a couple years ago in New York City, so that exact thing happened. Some bystanders got shot during a police-involved shooting. So there's that's stuff that they still have to take into account. They just also happen to get paid, and it's actually considered a requirement of their job to potentially have to move towards danger and stuff like that to protect the public. So... That's the difference between the average concealed carry license holder and a police officer. Now, in the military, handguns have always been kind of a secondary thing. And the idea being is that for some reason, your main weapon system, your rifle or machine gun or whatever went down, you would have a handgun in order to be able to get yourself to a position where you could figure out what's going on with the rifle or have like a last stand type thing going on where at least it's better than spit wads. Having a handgun would be better than spit wads. So a lot of times you'll see... Uh, and a lot of training for military types that have handguns available to them if their weapon fails for whatever reason. Magazine run dry, runs dry or uh, they have a malfunction or something along that line. They don't necessarily worry about it, it, situation withstanding. They don't necessarily worry about conducting a mag change or clearing the malfunction as much as they sweep the rifle out of the way and they go to the handgun at that point. And a lot of that's going to be because they're actively suppressing something. They're trying to attempt movement and having fire on that target is more important than getting the rifle back into action at that moment. But they utilize the handgun in order to be able to get to cover so that they can then figure out what's going on with the rifle, get it back up and into the fight. A little bit of an administrative reload on the handgun in case they need it again, and then back into action they go. That's how that the handgun gets utilized in a more professional type sense, and why being able to engage out to those distances might be more important, but still low probability shooting still a lot of issues involved with this type of low probability shooting. And if you're talking about war fighters, you're talking about somebody fighting in a conflict zone to where there's less likelihood of there being collateral damage, of there being non-combatants about. Not always the case. We've seen that in the global war on terror where there would still be a lot of non-combatants about, and there were issues with that. And people wound up in Leavenworth over it. So these are things, whenever we talk about low probability shooting as though it's, it's an easy or a reasonable expectation, we have to keep context in mind and why we should be seeking every opportunity to take shots as close as we can or remove ourselves from the situation. All right, guys, that's pretty much my thoughts on this particular subject. I hope you found this interesting and it's pretty much what I got. Have a good day.